Good morning, Philip. Sandy, how are you this morning? I'm doing well. Hmm? I am doing well. I'm a little stressed out because uh, school started this week for me, as well as working full time, and I've already missed the first deadline. For your like classwork, you mean that yeah. you have to turn in? Yeah. So I'm going to grad school. How does and that make you feel? The first thing was introductions. And in the paragraph of introductions that I was supposed to post online, it said it had to be an APA format. <laughs> it just was like, oh, forget about it. So anyway, I'm really excited about this because this will distract me from the fact that I'm already behind and it's three days into school. Okay. Well, you know that I've been with the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery for 23 years, and I believe in that very first year I had the privilege of meeting Mr. Joe Powell from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Joe, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone, <laughs> and uh, Phil Valentine and Miss Sandy Valentine. Right? I'm Joe Powell, and I'm a young person in long-term recovery. Nice. And what that means is is that I haven't had a drink in 33 years and haven't used any opiates in probably over 45 years. And it's only because of long-term recovery. I'm also able to be a father and a husband and a lifelong learner and a servant leader and the president and CEO of APA, the Association of Persons Affected by Addiction in Dallas. Now, 24 years now, since yeah. 1998. Wow. <laughs> you guys started the party. Yes, we did. We started a big party, and, it, and the party continues. <laughs> so you said you were a young person in recovery. Now, wait a minute. You've got like uh, 33 years of recovery. You've been doing this. You're a young person. Really, Joe? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Ex Explain yourself. All right. Well, the spirit, the spirit is young, continues uh, to be young. You know, uh, yeah, you know, I always say that when I was born, I came out of my mother's womb and said, showtime. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. When I jumped out there, right, and then it was on television, right, at four years old. We'll get back to that. But that spirit, you know what I mean, throughout New York and then showtime, show business, smiling, entertaining, you know, and then, of course, you know, the addiction took over, but then when recovery took over, it was able to get that spirit back, you know, of the young people. So I did some things. The young, the young part is one is vegetarian, because you know I grew up, you know, in a household where my mother used to sell dinners like chitlin dinners, pig feet, pork chops, you know what I mean, beef and ribs, and you know, and uh, for many years. And then I remember fasting um, for a couple of days. Um, and then when I started to fast, that changed. I noticed that my spirit was different. It felt different when I didn't eat for like two days straight, you know, yeah. and then for two and then three days, uh, you know, you just drink water. And uh, I was like, wow, you know, being the, and then once I had cut the path of addiction in my brain, my brain always say, you know, anything that makes me feel good, give me more, give me more, mm -hmm. give me more. And including that kind of spirit of feeling good even without meat or without food. Mm. Uh, I wanted that. I wanted to keep How do I keep that? So they said, well, the only way to keep that is vegetarian. Yeah. And so over 35 years now of not eating any meat. So this morning, I still, every morning now, I still get up and I do uh, 50 push-ups. I uh, did 60 push-ups this morning. I did 50 uh, sit-ups this morning, all right? And I uh, stretched a little bit, and uh, and that's it. So for a 70-year-old guy, right, uh, then I think that that's pretty good. So that's why that young man in long-term recovery coming, because, you know, coming through the military also just a couple of years, you know, and all of that, uh, you know, that is, uh, it's been a lot. But still to hold on to that young people. I need to ha hang on, Phil, to that young spirit in long-term recovery. You know? And so that's what the model, I think, for me, as far as being an example, too, for my staff and for the community, you know, what is a young man in long-term recovery? So talk to Phil Valentine. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she's already said that you look way younger than I do, so I don't know what that means exactly. <laughs> 
Do you want to expand on that part? No, let's not expand on that. But Joe just dropped a whole lot of things I'm interested in. So Showtime, New York, um, all the things. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your beginnings? Yeah, and why did you say like when you were born, they say it's Showtime because that's just who you are? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was passed down. It was passed down, you know, um, which passing down gets into a whole lot of stuff that was mm -hmm. passed down. But uh, but my dad, my dad was uh, Hat Cane and Trey. Mm -hmm. It was the name of his group. And he he specialized in the top hat. He 12. They had tuxedos, top hats. They 12 canes and, and the silver platters. Yeah. Spin yeah. a silver platter, right? So mm -hmm. Hat Cane and Trey you know, who danced all over the world, which was my dad and Curtis and Jesse, two other guys. They, uh, you know, for years, they tap dance. And of course, uh, once he met my mom, and like my mom had seven boys and one girl. But the first three, I'm the third in the star of the show. Right? <laughs> but the third, you know, because there was the Powell brothers and dad. So the Powell brothers and dad, you know, of course, and uh, the first three kids that were born, my dad started teaching us how to tap dance. And at four years old, here I am on CBS, the Ted Mack Amateur Hour Show, you know, back then, which was like the American Idol today. And they got all kind of talent shows today. But uh, but back then, in 19, at four years old, was at 1955. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we was on television. So that like took off. You know, and we was big stars, you know, danced with Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, you know, at, at Madison Square Garden with, you know, all of the Jackson Five and all of So, you know, all throughout, we was like these childhood stars in, in Harlem and in the projects that I grew up in, you know. And uh, and there was a lot going on in the 50s and the 60s, you know, and which got right into my addiction because we actually, we also danced at the nightclub. So, you know, when you dance at nightclubs in Harlem, where the show don't start till midnight. <laughs> you know? And uh, here I am, five years old at the nightclub. You know, and I remember, you know, for 10 years, the celebrity club in Harlem, uh, which was big. I remember sneaking my first drink of alcohol at 10 years old from off the table. Somebody had a drink. I said, I got to see what all this is about. All this noise and partying, you know. And I see all this. So that's, that really started something right there, which cut that path of, uh, okay, this is the pleasure. This is what they, they're feeling. Even though a 10-year-old really didn't get it at that time. But, but it was back to, I need to try to give me some more of that, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's pretty much the beginning uh, right there for years of show business. But a lot of trauma and drama because of my father was alcoholic. So we didn't succeed because of the alcoholic dad, you know, even though we was on magazines and televisions and all over New York. But, you know, when you have an alcoholic dad, that right there can stop a lot of stuff. He didn't know how to really just continue to pass it on and really succeed, even though we had managers and all that right there. But the selfishness of alcoholism can really, uh, you know, prevent a lot of success, uh, especially mm -hmm. with family. Yeah. And my mother continued to have children. So we had seven boys and one girl, eight of us in that house with my mom and dad you know, for years, uh, which was, you know, fun for sometimes, and then sometimes it wasn't because of the trauma and drama that, that went on in the house. And then what was happening outside the house, because remember, we had civil rights movement then, too, mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. So I'm, I'm in the riots, you know what I mean, in Harlem, and, you know, I'm protesting in Harlem, and, you know, having to go to school with the Black Panther Party on the rooftop, and then Malcolm X on the corner, I see him almost every day, you know, and then a, a lot is going on. So in and out. So a lot of that to medicate. That's where alcohol and drugs really came in. It became more of a medication for me. Right. How do I disassociate myself, you know, in this house and also even out, you know, I mean, and try to finish school and, and everything else. So it was a lot really going on at that time. How at that age did you understand what was happening with the civil rights movement, especially in contrast with being in show business and receiving attention for your talent? 
That is a great question mm -hmm. right there. But that was, again, the medication, the show business, the entertainment part, too, because Will Smith, he actually says it now, what well, he says it in his book, and I actually heard him say it on YouTube. But for me, too, on the stage was the safest place for me. Mm -hmm. When we came out and they said, all right, the Powell Brothers, right? And we come out there and you got all these people and they're clapping and they, you know, watching us. And, and for me to entertain not only was it a medication, but it was a safe space. For me. Mm -hmm. On the stage, that was the safest place with me and my two brothers and my dad on stage. You know, because when we came off the stage that night, it was going to be a lot of you know violence and trauma at the house. Because my dad had, to, he always said, "I got to go walk my leg." Well, when he said he got to walk his leg, <laughs> that means he's going, to, he's going to get you know intoxicated. He's getting ready to go and come back to the house, and it's just not going to be fun. You know, and we was always, I was always scary. So that's where the, the PTSD comes in for young people, like what you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. how did you go through what was going on in their, in the world, in the community, outside, versus even inside. And that's where a lot of, because I tell people all the time with, with my family, because all seven brothers and one sister struggled with some kind of a mental health or substance use, right, or some kind of addiction uh, because of uh, the trauma that happened early on. So yeah. Yeah. We didn't you, 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 you talk about your childhood with such ease and acceptance, right? You seem really at peace with who you are and who you are today. Um, describe the process a little bit of how you've come to the realization of all, all of this. And, and I mean, you grew up in a time where um, you were, you had some celebrity, you had some fame, you were around people that did. And to get to this point is what a journey. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it is, you know, when God continued to show, show out and <laughs> continue with the lessons and the blessings every day. But the, uh, yeah, that started, of course, even when, when I came to Texas, of course, you know, I, uh, enlisted to go to the Vietnam in, uh, in 1970 because uh, I saw on television that they was dying in Vietnam from heroin. And at that time, alcohol and heroin, of course, it started out with alcohol, but I moved on into, you know, every other drug that I can get to medicate what was going on in the community. So back to your question earlier, too, said, how did all this go together? So what was, I medicated whatever I can get my hands on, right? Wow. But the heroin had, you know, of course, after high school, pretty much took over. Uh, and that's when I didn't know how, and there wasn't no places to stop. I remember going into the Phoenix house even one time, and then it just didn't, uh, I guess that was my first experience that, well, people are getting it and trying to get help because they had flooded Harlem with heroin, mm -hmm. you know, and so it was like the, the main drug. And uh, was that the time with <laughs> was that the time with the Denzel Washington movie? Yeah, <laughs> is that that was that right? Where they were bringing right, it in? Right, right, right. Yeah, what was it? The American Gangster, the Gangster. And, and you were there. And was that accurate? More or less. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of that, yeah, pretty much, you know, yeah, that was just a, a way of life in Harlem, wow. you know, yeah, Denzel was just, you know, yeah, one of them, but the, uh, yeah, back then, so to see that, that they was dying in Vietnam, right, from heroin, so that was my way out, that I'm either going to go over there and shoot up heroin and die, or either I'm get shot up by bullets and die, so I was on a suicide mission. You know, and that's, and that's where how I even look at heroin today with all the overdoses that these kids, you know, they all on, you know, that's a suicide mission. You're shooting heroin, you know, and we already know how much proof do we know how many over 100,000 every this is today. So even back then, for me, you know, I, you know, I got that, uh, that that was my way out. That, uh, you know, it was time for me to go. I mean, if I come back out of this, I'm going to be a heck of a soldier or, or whatever, you know. And, uh, but so, and then, so I ended up going in, I did finish infantry training and my orders was Vietnam. So when they send, but they send you home first, you have to say goodbye to your family before they send to Vietnam, right? And I went home and of course, what did I do? I went right back to the drugs right, and alcohol and all of that. And, uh, 
I remember even uh, with my uniform on the rooftop by myself, and that was really a suicide. God, like, really said, nah, you ain't even, you got a long way to go. You ain't getting away that easy. You know, <laughs> you said, uh, an interview with Phil Valentine and saying, so you, you, know, you ain't getting away that easy. So, <laughs> but anyway, because uh, I remember, you know, with a needle hanging out of my arm with my uniform on, and the police kicking on me in the roof, on top of the roof. In New York, back then. So you know, you by yourself, and that's one thing we tell people: you don't want to do be by yourself. And then had the time sobriety, you know. I mean, I was supposed to, because I was clean, you know. My body wasn't. Anyway, uh, so stuff like that, uh, you know, from there. And then uh, when I got out, and then I came back to New York, and I got into a program, and they said, "Who want to go to Waco, Texas, to take any trades you want to take?" And, you know what I mean? And get out of New York. I was like, I got to get out of New York. I already know what's up. So that geographical location changed, right? And I said, all right. And that pretty much did it. They gave us a uh, plane fare to go. And of course, I bought a Greyhound bus ticket instead of plane fare and then bought me some, some dope and some methadone. And with the two methadone pills on the Greyhound bus, I detoxed myself. It took almost two days. It took over a day almost two days to get on the local Greyhound bus to get to Waco from New York City. And that was my detoxing that I did with those men. And I hadn't picked up any opiates since then, since January of 1970. That was 73? Yeah, the beginning of 73. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's been a while since, you know, I did any, but I continued to drink to 1988. That's when, uh, so back to your question, Phil, about the process, you know, still, hadn't really had no relationship with God, even though I was baptized, you know, by Adam Clayton Powell. So mm -hmm. Adam Clayton Powell was the minister and also the congressman in New York at Abyssinia Church, you know, so, uh, and that was huge, you know, so, you know, of course, but the only time we went to church was when my grandmother came over and said, hey, I'm taking the boys to church, you know, uh, but other than that, you know, it wasn't a biggie, you know, back then, that relationship, even with the, the church. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think that uh, until 88, you know, I mean, I continued and, of course, went to school and uh, had a family. And uh, what, were you, what were you doing for work in those days? Man, you know, when I, uh, when I, when I first fasted, matter of fact, I was working at the post office. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually got a job at the post office, what, in 75, something like that, after I came to Texas, in Waco, Texas. So I did, you know, I had, I was able to get jobs, you know, a job, uh, uh, and, um, but I ended up getting terminated there, even at the post office, you know. Uh, and so, you know, the alcoholism continued, the same type of thinking continued, and really, uh, so it was a lot, you know, but it was jobs, you know, I had, you know, working jobs, Best Buy, ended up being a manager at a restaurant, even one time, you know, you know, just had that, uh, at least the, uh, uh, the, the aid with the relationships as well as the intelligence to at least to get a job and hold a job for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I paid the rent, but it wasn't sustainable. So what was that contrast like of, of being a performer then the military, which yeah. is a complete switch, and now right. you're working the average guy jobs. Right, right, right. It must yeah. have been a well, mental transition. It was, it was, it was. It was definitely a mental transition. Matter of fact, the book that I'm writing is all about the stages that I go from the show business stage, right, to the next stage of, you know what I mean, where I went at, with even the military, suicide, all of that. But yeah. the stage that we're on now, the advocacy stage, right? And, uh, so it's uh, several different stages of, of life and moving into recovery. Uh, so the contrast, yeah, is... I mean, it is. It was challenging, you know, but because it's still the personality that we you know, of course, the raising, born with, you know what I mean. And this mm -hmm. is is that you know I couldn't couldn't get rid of that. Feel mm -hmm. so yeah. early on, and even you know, I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. about that, but uh, but definitely, yeah. yeah. I think that I, that's one thing that I use. I guess the uh, uh, the highlight of my personality is able to 
connect with people and people, you know what I mean? And I, I like people. And of course, I show business entertainment. So I use that also um, in relationships um, to really to move forward. Hmm. So I didn't get to the therapy part and all that. So that came later, of course, for the move toward health. I'm not healthy yet. We just we still work. Well, I agree. So you're not healthy yet. But tell me what was the precipitating factor what happened what made you decide to put to do get do something well i think that the um, i did meet someone I, I finally met somebody and said you know hey you know that people uh, get sober because uh, this person knew that i drank pretty much you know every day and i said people get sober no i don't know by now in new york i would have thought that i had and even in the military that i would have thought that i had at least been to a B. I'm sure in the, in, in, the, in the military I did. But I hadn't heard of that as a kid. Here we are in New York City. Nobody said to me, you know what? Uh, your dad don't have to die like this. You know, and he finally died from alcoholism. But nobody ever said to us that there's a group, there's a meeting, there's some guys right around the corner there that's sober, you know what I mean? And <laughs> these guys here were, were, could probably support and help your dad you know what i mean and but nobody i don't remember anybody i mean we call the police you know many nights you know and the police come and say come on tommy we're gonna take you for a walk you know what i mean and of course he you know come right back and then we have to live like that you know but nobody said that's why you know the rcos are so important because you know here you are in the community mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we got to be loud enough where it's no excuse where somebody's saying, because, you know, for, for, my, for us to go through that, for a family to go through that, right? So, but anyway, um, that goes back. So for me, yeah, when somebody said, well, you know, come on, I want you to hang out and meet, meet some people. And they actually took me to a meeting at a church, <laughs> you know, and, and that really started. They said, well, and then after I've been this meeting, then they said, well, Joe, in here, you know, and it was hard to believe all these folks were so, you know what I mean? But uh, they said, well, in there you got to get a sponsor. And I said, a sponsor? What's that? Oh, don't worry about it. Just ask that old dude over there. Ask that old dude over there, you know, and, you know, here I am all these years. I don't trust, I don't trust anybody. It's hard to trust anybody, you know. I don't, you know what I mean? I mean, me and God ain't got it like that yet, you know what I mean? So I don't trust anybody. But uh, they said, well, just ask that old dude over there. So I asked him, you know, and of course, and he said, well, you got to call me, you know, every day. Call you every day. I don't even call God, nobody, every day. What is, what is this, you know, going on here? You know, and then, uh, you know, <laughs> so he had, but he said, call me at this hospital and then call me at this hospital. And then we didn't have cell phones then, so he said, call me on my pager, right? And I'm like, what? And so he scared me because he said, call me at the hospital. So why would I call him at the hospital? And I'm thinking, well, I hope, you know, and now my PTSD is sort of full of fear. So on the way out, I said, well, who's this guy here? He told me to call him at the hospital. Oh, he said, oh, that's Dr. Deer. He's a psychiatrist. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want it here. I don't want no. I ran and got me a drink of alcohol. I never got me a drink. You know what I mean? And uh, it was too much. You know, it took me a, a couple of weeks to surrender. But yeah, I was like, what? I had to think about all that, you know, over, before I could really come to some type of surrender and trust or say, all right, we've got to do something different. You know what I mean? Mm. Did, he I, did he become your sponsor? For 30 years, uh, he no. died. Yeah, wow. he, he passed uh, a couple of years ago. I just we just named the building after him and everything, the living room, all of that after him. But yeah, I mean, he was a circuit AA speaker. I mean, he helped more people as a psychiatrist, but more in, in the program than, than any place else. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm traveling with him, we're going all over the place with him. You know. Uh, you know, and he was about, he was 80 years old when he passed uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. wow. Great guy. Yeah. yeah. 
30 years. So, but we didn't do no psych. He ain't, he didn't play that with me, no, that psychiatry. So we work in real, 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 it's all about recovery. And that's what I learned too about peer to peer, because here he is, you know what I mean? No matter what, you know what I mean? His, you know, his profession was, but for me, he was a uh, peer. He made sure of that, you know, he loved it when, uh, in, 90, in uh, yeah, 98, when we started the recovery movement, you know, to see all this, you know, and it was like, wow, this is so cool right here, you know. So, but he didn't, you know, he, being a psychiatrist and all that, you know, he pretty much maintained, you know, his, his, his profession. But a uh, great guy. Mm -hmm. great. So how did that happen? How did you end up working in the recovery movement? Well, I think that, yeah, from there, you know, I ended up because of the mental health challenges. Like I say, I always say, because he didn't, and he never diagnosed. I never been really diagnosed, you know. But I, I know that I have. P I always say I have PTSD. You know, what I mean, uh, because of the fears that come up and the feelings that come up automatically, um, and the thoughts even sometimes. But I think that uh, for my recovery. Uh, and that was like with him. It just started with him. And the first thing he said, you know, they said, well, you got to do what your sponsor said. So, and one is call him every day. <laughs> he said, you know, and to do that, that was a, a whole nother, you know, spirit of, of accountability and lifestyle because I never, I never did that before. And I remember after five years of calling him every day, you know, and the thing is, he never did say that I'm on, I'm on, answer the phone. <laughs> he just said, you need to call me every day. And so of course my <laughs> messages. <laughs> but yeah, I think that uh, all of the, the lessons that went with that, he said, you got to go back to school. I ended up going back to school, becoming a licensed chemical dependency counselor uh, myself, you know, uh, for addiction. And, uh, and so, and then working with mental health. I think that that was a really great learning for me too. Mental health connections, Dallas Metro Care. Uh, I really did dual diagnose groups back then, you know, and uh, that was fun. Everybody remembered me by that because I had lines of people that wanted to get into that to those groups, right? Those dual recovery groups, and so uh, that was fun. And all that was before '98, before we actually started. So when the when the grants came out, you know, and then, you know, we got the word and uh, just in the community, the guys that we they were there, we hung out with, right? This was just a group of us, women and men. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know that uh, the government has put out something, they're looking for people in recovery to, to, to hang out or to be a part, they need something. You know, they need some help, you know what I mean, for people in recovery. So, they, you know, these were supposed to be the first RFPs, you know, with proposals, requests for recovery. Uh, and when we learned that, so we got together and uh, and that's when we uh, wrote the grant. And then, of course, I was selected, you know, to be like, you know, the leader, I guess, or whatever, you know, and uh but I was still working. I actually volunteered. You know, we started APA, you know, the association. So the first four years, you know, I was just hanging out with Phil Valentine and Bob Savage, you know, and, and all of the guys that, you know, have been all over the country, you know, the, uh, they really got the grants. And then we started, you know, hanging out and going to Washington, D.C. But, yeah, that the, the recovery movement started. So I think what, looking at a little bit of this with, you know, of course, from the community and the mental health and addiction and what was happening in recovery and my recovery, you know, and growing there. And then when the grants hit, you know, and then for those four years to really look at the movement and hanging out with, you know, the national movement fellows, uh, then that right there, uh, really moved me to that next to the next level because I think when the next grant came out in twenty what is oh three oh two oh three the next uh, grant because we got the first one but then the next one it was like now I'm executive director and I'm gonna go ahead and just move everything into getting paid now and really moving this uh, to the next level so but yeah the advocacy piece was the first grant that we all got and then we moved to the support. I watched Phil navigate being somebody whose recovery was core 12 steps and then move into this place with the RCOs of putting his face on recovery. And um, honestly, I saw him get some heat from our friends 
and 12-step fellowships. What what was that transition like for you? <laughs> it's still, it's still, we still get some heat. <laughs> I just got heat last week, bro. But uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was, uh, for me, I think being also African-American and then looking at, and I love it how we moved into multiple paths. Uh, but yeah, at first, because most of us in the movement right, all across the country came out of the 12 step movement, right? So, you know, that was, uh, you know, easier, uh, so off the way for us. But I think that, uh, definitely, yeah, the heat is that, you know, and, and I love it because with Bill and Phil and, and everybody else, we all looked at, you know what I mean, that whole people do recover in this, man, even, you know, Bill W, you know, there's many paths you know mm-hmm. uh, so we did just come to the grip that you know well you know we want people we want to be there for people you know mm-hmm. one and how do we support you the thing is is how can i support you right and also and even the health that ties into how healthy is the staff how healthy is the community our, our goal and purpose is right can we move this community toward health, wellness, and recovery? You know, that's every day for me. And uh, so I think, yeah, that even though the 12-step is great and uh, it is very healthy because it's a spiritual path, that's the God deal with it, you know, is that you can keep it simple, mm-hmm. you know. But it's how do you, with people, of course, everybody have their ways of knowing and their ways of doing things. Um, who are we? to each other and who are we to others when it comes to recovery. Uh, so yeah, the, the, I think that it, it really ties into how can we really just support everyone, right? And whatever path that they choose, that you have, but there is choices and we need to really show sometimes the choices they don't know, you know? Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't know because people say, I don't, I don't want no 12 step program and I ain't going to church. Mm-hmm. Ooh. All right. So, mm-hmm. What does that look like then? Hey, we can ready to have some fun now then. All right. <laughs> what would you like to do, right? That's right. Then, if you don't, don't want to do those, what would you like to do? Yeah. I think it for me in the especially in the last five to ten years, it's hard to put a number on it. But to see so many different pathways emerge, especially with young people, they're staying in recovery in ways that when we came into into recovery they would have said you're going to die if you do it that way but, <laughs> but here they are they're thriving and they're doing well in life and you go yeah. hmm, they're just they're just proven and yes, they're proving us they help me open my eyes you know and and i think as as soon as i got into c car and saw that people recovered in different ways it opened my mind to all po- all possibilities, all potential. And this is the key point that people, a lot of people still don't understand. Just because I get in recovery a certain way doesn't mean everybody has to recover that way. And doesn't mean if you recover in a pathway that's different than mine, your pathway is not a threat to me. Right. You know, we feel like we're threatened because somebody wants to do something different. I mean, and I I don't understand that piece. Right, right, right. And that's the, and really that's the challenge, it seems like, in this country with almost everything, that people feel threatened about something different. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, that you're doing something different. Everybody is supposed to be, <laughs> you know, to be this way, right? Uh and that's not, you know, that's the way to be to fight. Well, well, I don't know if you know this, but you you really helped me in a great deal about consistently talking about your mental health work and that being a part of the addiction and the recovery community. I said, I'm like, no, we don't want, because I grew up under Bob Savage. No, we don't want anything to do with those mental health people. You know, what's going on with all that? <laughs> but so, but I think we had the, we still do have a level of acceptance of different pathways of different viewpoints. Yeah. And you helped me open my mind. And you weren't like, Phil, you need to change your... No, you just said, this is my experience here in Dallas. This is what's working. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So thank yeah. you for that, too. So we just... 
I think that when we accept each other and, and learn from each other, that's really the key to moving the the movement forward. Right. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, especially in our work, because we have the opportunity for masses of people, right, and to give them those choices and options. You know, my sponsor used to say that maturity is options, right? So the more options I have, the much more mature I am. Because, you know, in addiction, it was only one way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's my way, and, you know, and I'm getting tore up first. <laughs> but, but I think that, uh, yeah, today, especially the, the recovery movement, wellness, and I think Bill White talks about that too, of how powerful that the movement can be when it comes to health, wellness, and recovery, you know, today, because there are a lot of people not getting it. You know what I mean? How do you prioritize health? Yeah. You know, when I ain't even, I'm still out there, I'm still lost, you know what I mean? Uh, but I might be working in the field you know, behavior help. I might be, you know, I mean, have a family, but, you know, but my health is probably the one thing, you know, that can take this to a whole nother level of health and wellness for the family and for the community and every single person. Uh, and that's what I, you know, what the work that I do today, even with my staff is how healthy are you? You know what I mean? How, how healthy are we, you know? Because the challenge is coming is always about something internal, some healthy, unhealthy thing, you know, is what, even just being dishonest, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which is step one stuff mm-hmm. for us, you know, but, you know, but being dishonest can really cause some serious health. Problems, but, you know. Yeah. Joe, Joe yes. I have one question for you and then you can have your question. I'm sorry. Honey. Okay. But. You've been with APA now for, what, 23, 24 years, same as mm-hmm. me and CCAR? Mm-hmm. What would you say, list some crowning achievements, if you will? Ah. <laughs> well, one is the sustainability, I think, first, that we've <laughs> we sustained this far. Here we are again, Phil. Here we are 24 years later. I think that that's probably number one that we did. How do we do it now? It's, yep. it's a whole other thing, right? And, you know, that's what uh, Dr. Clark uh, mentioned about a month or two ago. I was talking to him, but he said, well, where's the, the process data? We're talking about all this data, but what was the process that you went through to get here? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you know, so these milestones are some of the things that that has that Apple has accomplished. And I think that uh, including, uh, I think, Dr. Deer, one uh, again, to even name a building after him for us to highlight how, you know, peer to peer um, to really to really solidify that for me, even through, you know, with recovery, that what is peer to peer? How does peers really uh support each other in the, in that relationship mm-hmm. uh, because you know that's the thing to for me today how the kids have lost a lot of them have lost connection and they're not connected today so staying connected right is huge um and i i think the other one for me is you know because uh in the community that uh that we serve there's a lot of challenges right and uh pretty much I've been, you know, I kept it pretty much in Texas, you know, um, as far as doing a lot. I think that's a, another biggie is helping the state, helping the government, you know, the work that we've done to help the whole country to move forward. Uh, and that, and there's many ways that, we, that that all of us have done that, you know. And I think that it, that's the cool thing that we've all contributed. Uh, but I think that with APA, one is again is working with the, the the government, the county, the city, working with them to move toward wellness and recovery. Be an example. What does that look like? The recovery community organization. We're still not loud enough. It seems like on what is a RCO, right? And I guess and also we don't have enough of compared to what we said we wanted. I think 24 years ago, and every city should be a RCO in the country. We still got states that don't have it. What? Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, but I think that, yeah, the work that we have done, you know, the impact that we've made, and even with the court systems, you know, and I remember, you know, the judges 20 years ago saying, hey, I'm getting ready to start this thing called divert court, drug court, mental health court, veterans court. 
but we need somebody to joke and they come down and help us with that, you know what I mean? Uh, and then managed care, you know, being one of the first, uh, and matter of fact, CCAR too was right there with value options. <clears throat> so for to have a, a managed care contract, you know, as a peer organization to build managed care, to build, you know, those, and that was a learning experience, but it was something, it was huge for RCO, right, in the country uh, back then. Uh, but also to see how the state can, can just change everything and then kick, <laughs> kick the man's care company out there to kick you and you lose a million dollars a year. I mean, easy because of the state decided, ah, we don't want that no more. Yeah, just, just need to do something different. And that was it. Uh, that wasn't fun. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a learning experience, right? So those lessons and blessings that continue uh, with each milestone. Uh, and so th there's a, a lot uh, that we that we did, you know, being culturally congruent and continue to be culturally con congruent to the communities that we serve. I always say that, and I'm, I'm really trying to blow that up. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, can you, can you expand on that? I've not heard that term yet. Right, yeah, and that gets really, it ties into multiple paths when it's going to be culturally congruent to the community, so the Latino community. So one of the groups that we started years ago was Bienvenido, which means welcome in Spanish, right? Um, for to have, you know, the Spanish, you know, uh, support group, right, for them and families, you know, how do they do culture? So, you know, when you're talking about a path, you know, it's a, it's a culture, too. There should be principles even to live by with each one of these paths. You know what I mean? And whether you don't even see the principles, if somebody asks you, you should be able to know, well, honesty is what is in that path. I hope honesty is in there somewhere. You know? mm -hmm. And I always tell people about that, how, okay, so what path? You're talking about a Christian path? So there's principle, Christian principles to live by. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, you know, uh, when you look at, you know, Don Coyers or or smart recovery or whatever, you know, these all have some ways to live by where it's a design for living, even in these parts, right? Mm -hmm. also. Uh, so being culturally congruent, right, is for that community. What does that community look like? Because it might be a very rich community with, you know, a lot of great uh, resources and privileges right there, you know, to where you don't have to do a whole lot, but be there as an RCO and then you know, and once the word get out or once you start doing some advocacy and community outreach and all that, you know, you still can uh, fill the community center or the organization where we're able to get uh, people involved. So any community, uh, Don Coyus was a good example because, you know, me and him and Phil and all of us, you know, were started, you know, uh, facing voices. But I remember Don sitting next to me when he said, you know what, this ain't doing it for me. He said, this ain't doing it for my people. Mm -hmm. uh, when he, and he left, you know, <clears throat> the board. But what did he start? <laughs> you know, then the next thing, you know, the 350, I don't know how many. I think I talked to him recently. I forgot how many fire starters. He started fire starters of recovery, right? And so, but the Native American, the Well Bridey movement, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's blowed up with the white bison. So, uh but, I, you know, that's why I say they're being culturally congruent to whatever community. It could be a Native American community or what, but how do you bring recovery there, right? And what does recovery look like there? And there still could be many paths even in that community, right? But being culturally congruent is that you do know the culture of the community, yeah. right? I like that phrase. I'm going to be using that phrase a lot. Uh, Joe, Recently, you know, Michael Askew retired from CCAR a couple of years ago, and you guys are into this new project. Tell us about that. Right. And that's exactly what that's about. I mean, I've, hopefully, uh, and yeah, they, it's all about being culturally congruent, right, to mm -hmm. communities of color. This project is called the, uh, it's CARD, the name of the organization, and CARD stands for the Center for African American Recovery Development. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. And so that's going into, you know, African-American communities, into the black community. And they're really just, you know, ones that don't have nothing. You know what I mean? Um, no, you know, and so, uh, you know, high in the disparities, high in, you know what I mean, all kind of overdoses, et cetera now. Uh, 
in uh, addiction, et cetera, mental health too. But can we go in to these communities, right, and really provide some uh, recovery support services? Can we really develop something and help the community if the community welcomes us? They got to, we got to be invited. We got to be welcomed through you know, <laughs> in these. So uh, with the culture, right, of the community. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what CARD is about, or C-A-R-D. And so it's just getting started. It is something that uh, FAMSA has agreed to support. Um, so uh, it's, but that's a lot of work, you know, and I'm a young and <laughs> long term. And, and uh, Mike, you know, Mike is, uh, is great, you know what I mean, to give him something to do. And, you know, he's the executive director right now, so it's cool. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. You know, and we got a lot of young people that's part of CARD too, it's, you know what I mean? And they've seen the success. But again, you know, coming into a community and, the, you know, and starting uh, RCOs and then moving the communities toward wellness, you know, and recovery, that is, uh, can take a little bit, you know. As we wrap up this, um, you talked about writing a book, right? <laughs> and I think as I'm approaching, you know, I'm 60, how old am I? Two, but, uh, but not for long. I'll be 63 soon. So, uh, you know, mm. thoughts of like, how long do you do this? But one of the things I want to leave bef um, behind is the history of CCAR. So you mentioned like Dr. Clark talked, how'd you get here? So I also talked to Bill White a little bit about writing chapters of, of from my perspective, of how we grew, how we managed challenging times because we've all had our difficulties what's your book about joe what are you writing about yeah i know <laughs> you, you, you talked about stages and when right. are you going to have it done for us <laughs> that's a good question there I, I don't even know that yet i'm still i talked to bill white about it too he the one that really said joe we need some memoirs or something yeah, you need to write so uh you know, yeah, it's it's in the process right now, um, and it is making progress uh, a little bit. So we'll see. I still need a lot more. The name is still because uh, because of my show business, and the thing is for me though is uh, the isms. So when we look at you know alcoholism, mm -hmm. right, and all the other ableism, sexism, and all of that right there, racism, you know. Uh, then, of course, you know, all that ties into, you know, me growing up, you know, and then especially being raised and coming out into the family with alcoholism, right? <clears throat> and then, you know, all of the, the racism that growing through that, too. And then here we are again, you know, and the mic, we picked up the mic again. So, and I tell people, don't drop the mic, whatever you do, don't drop the mic. Uh, so... But I think, yeah, so that all ties into what is the name going to be? <laughs> so I've actually coined another phrase, uh, which I'm going to highlight probably in the book, is uh, show businessism. Well, show business, show business. So instead of uh, like alcoholism, but show business, because show business kills also. And so many people died from drugs and alcohol. When you look at Michael Jackson and Prince and uh, Whitney Houston, so many, you know, movie stars and everything have died because of showbism, because of the drugs and alcohol that was used while they as an entertainer. Now, they didn't, you know, we wasn't born into the drugs and alcohol. We were probably born and raised into show business. A lot of these folks started very young as entertainers. But once the drugs, you know, and back then in my day, in our day, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol was just part of, Entertainment is part of the life, you know, it's part of, you know, what people do. It's like the norm, you know, back. But it also, you know, progresses until it becomes fatal, right? <clears throat> so, and that's where, uh, for me in the book, and even with the show Bism, because when I look at, even to listen to Will Smith and all of these guys and how they all came through it. And some made it through and became healthy and ended up in therapy or, you know what I mean, and really got and really came through the program or some path of recovery, which is great. But if you didn't, you know, then you, you stayed stuck and you either, you know, died from the addiction 
<clears throat> or you know, either you know, you really struggled really bad uh, because of the health wasn't there. So I think that today, <clears throat> the health part, that's why it's so important what we do as far as because it covers everybody with health, <clears throat> wellness, and recovery. Uh, <clears throat> so, so that's a. Uh, that's where my book is at right now. I mean, I've got, you know, of course, some few chapters. We're still uh, still writing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll look forward to that for sure. Yes. Um, uh, and I'm going to be on YouTube tonight checking out those tap dancing videos because uh, that's one thing besides being in recovery, Joe, we have in common. I was a tap dancer at age four, but I don't think, it, right. I don't think it made it past the middle school stage <laughs> of, you know, performing on the stage of the local middle school. But Thank you, Joe. You know how much I love you and I respect you and admire yeah. you. You've been an inspiration all these years. So I hope we get to see each other soon. Yes, me too. Me too. Me too. I love y'all too very much. And thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. All you right. have a sparkling day, my friend. You too. You too. Bye, Sandy. Bye, Joe. All right. Talk to you later, Phil. Bye.